All right, let's stand up and worship this morning, everyone. It's a good day to be in the house of God, amen. Amen. Christ is my firm foundation.
Come on, can we just take a couple seconds here this morning, close your eyes and just think of his faithfulness to you, how he has been faithful in the past, how he will be faithful in the future. And whether you believe it or not, he's faithful right now in this current season of your life. Can you just remember, look back on your life time and time again, how he's been faithful, how he's pulled through, how he was actually near when you thought he was so so far away.
let him change your life today. God sent his only son, his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would have eternal life, would not perish. God did not come to be served, but to serve. And once and for all, he has canceled out our debt, set it aside forever that we can live free, unhindered, and be blameless and holy in his sight. Today, I believe there are many of you in here today. I used to cower in the back too. I used to hold this and tremble. Do not let anyone hinder how you worship your Jesus. Amen? Amen. Do not let anyone, even yourself, hinder how you worship your Jesus. Amen? So listen, we're going to lift up this, this declaration. In my life, be lifted high. In our world, be lifted high. In our love, be lifted high. And I truly believe something changes when you surrender. Something changes when you move, when your knees hit the ground. So I'm asking you and I'm inviting you today. Just drop. As we sing this as one voice, brothers and sisters, I'm asking you and giving you permission, not that you need it, to just kneel down before the Lord or sit down, whatever that looks like. But can we give him all that we have in this moment? Because we are not going to get it back. It would not tell us to praise or lift our voices if something doesn't happen when we do that. Amen? Glory to you, Father, in my life. In my life, be lifted high in our world, Jesus. Be lifted high in our love. Be lifted high. This is our prayer, God. Jesus, be 
blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in the Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His in his love this is my story this is my song praising myself
Father, thank you for today. This morning, we declare our adoration towards you for our Savior, our Jesus. We fix our gaze on your victory this morning, Lord. We lift our voices to the name above all other names. We confess our shortcomings today. Lord, you know where we've messed up. And we're thankful this morning for your grace and your mercy that in spite of that, you love us unconditionally. That the victory has already been won in your name. Death could not hold you. You are victorious. Lord, thank you for the cross, the empty tomb, and the life found in the risen king this morning. Father, we thank you for Pastor Scott that he is here today. It's so good to have him back, and we're excited to hear the message that you've laid on his heart. Open our ears this morning to receive that well. Fill us with a deeper understanding this morning, Lord, a knowledge of you and your goodness. It's in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray together this morning. And all of his people said, amen. story. Well, it's not really our story. It's yours. You can't imagine the sorrow that day. Adam and Eve were devastated. We were too. But none of us could know God's grief. He keeps many things private. The misery only got worse. Adam and Eve ate some fruit and their children killed each other, their grandchildren did too. Soon the world was full of hatred. Those evening walks with God were long forgotten. Along with God's grief came God's anger. He decided to punish a world full of sin by filling it with water instead. You see, there's no getting around it. Sin must be punished. Yet, God told a man named Noah how to keep his family safe. Noah believed God. It was a special boat God designed, strong enough to endure the enraged waters and deliver people and animals to a clean new earth. Then God added a promise that stretched across the sky. From then on, storm clouds would be sliced through with the colors of heaven, reminding everyone that God's mercy will always color his anger as long as this world remains. We saw it in those waters, how serious God is about people's sin. But we saw in the, that ark how he'll make a way to save them anyway. It was beyond our understanding. But as we said, God keeps many things private. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for this very true, very real, very much still alive story. May we carry it in our hearts in everything that we do and say and think. We remember your son. We remember how you had a plan from the very beginning and how it all points, all of it, points to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. May you reveal it to us through your Holy Spirit in these coming weeks. We love you, Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, church. 
How are we doing this morning? So, uh, so as uh, Tim said, my name is Scott Eckenrode, and I'm the director of student ministries with Grand Point Church. And uh, this is our hometown. So, this is for those of you who don't know, um, my wife and I and my two boys. We live in Shippensburg. We, uh, my boys, attend Shippensburg High School and Middle School. And uh, this is this is where we call home. And I don't get to see you guys very often, as uh, I am the main youth pastor at Chambersburg. So, I'm um, I have duties up there that I have to do all the time. But um, that's who I am. And so. Now that we all know each other, I know every one of your names, you know who I am, we're good to go, right? So now we can kind of get into this message. Um, so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the story, not Christmas, not the uh, toy story, not the never-ending story, but we're going to be talking about um, the, the story of Christ and the redemption uh, that came to all humanity through this story. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks, over the next several weeks, and uh, as we begin this Christmas season, though, I have a question for you. When I say Christmas, when we use the word Christmas, what comes to your mind? What is the one thing that you think of whenever I say the word Christmas? Some of you may be thinking, oh, well, the birth of Christ. Yeah, that's something that we typically think of. It could be family gatherings. It could be family turmoil. It could be, oh, no, I have to see that particular relative that I don't like or, or the one that there's, there's maybe some dispute with the family and you're like, I don't really wanna have to deal with that. Maybe it's something exciting, like, you know what, we have uh, a new child in our family and we get to go see that new child. It could be the death of a family member. There's all kinds of different things when I say the word Christmas that could come to your mind. You may be thinking about a Christmas tree. I don't know, I'm throwing things out there now. Um, you may be thinking, okay, well, uh, what about Christmas gifts? And if you think about it, as children, Christmas gifts would be number one on our list, wouldn't it? When we say Christmas, immediately we think, oh, well, you know what, I think of Christmas, a Christmas gift, and, and if we're a child, we think that is our number one because they want the latest and the greatest toys, right? They want what everyone else, all their other friends have. And so they're thinking of a gift. They're thinking of, okay, what am I gonna get for Christmas this year? And then we grow up. And then it starts changing because what we, what we want starts to change a little bit differently because as adults, what's the one thing we think of when we think about Christmas and we think about a Christmas gift? We think of what do we need this year, right? We talk to our, our wives or our husbands and we say, okay, well, what do you need this year? Well, I... If you're like my wife and I, most of the time we're like, we don't need anything because we'll go buy it throughout the year. And then we sit there and rack our brains. Okay, what am I gonna get her? <sighs> Trust me, if you know anything, if you have any advice for me, let me know because that's where I'm at this year. I'm like, I don't know what to get her because she buys everything that she wants. And so it's really hard for me. Sorry, I don't wanna go down that road. But anyway, if you have any advice, let me know, okay? So anyway, so as, as adults, we think of what do we need, what do we need when it comes to Christmas? And there's a couple of different things we may be thinking of. Of course, we have the Christmas gift here. And in the Christmas gift, there's lots of different things. Like um, for, for the wives, we have the new jewelry. And this is real. This is a real diamond. Um, this is actually what I'm giving Amy for Christmas this year. So, But this is, um, we think of jewelry, okay? So jewelry is one thing we think of. Um, we think of tools, Okay. Men, we love tools, right? And so we know that our go-to is always a tool. Well, you can get me a tool, and I know that I'm gonna be happy. So get me a tool this year. Um, what, about, what about clothing? Okay, um, gentlemen, we all know, like, when, when our kids are younger, what do they get us? They get us a tie. Not me, because my boys know I don't wear ties. But for some of you, it may be a tie. It may be clothing. That's one thing that we think of. So we think of clothes. Now listen, the next one I'm gonna say is something that men, you need to be very cautious with because it could be an appliance for your wives. Be very cautious of that. Gentlemen, do not buy your wife a washer and dryer for Christmas. Unless she really wants it, don't buy her a vacuum either. This won't go well, okay? Just letting you know, please do not do that. But it could be an appliance. It could be something that you want that's practical. Um, what, about, what about a beauty supply? Okay, what about this? Um, anything to make us look prettier than what we really are. Trust me, um, I need help in this category. But we think like, okay, there's something that we need. Maybe it's, maybe it's you know what, just get me a mirror. I don't know, I'm just throwing things out there. Um, so it's a mirror. 
There's something that we're constantly thinking of. The last thing I wanna talk about is, I don't know, maybe you have a hobby. You have a hobby. And it's something, well, you, you know what? I, I love to ski, so if you could get me a new, new pair of skis, that'd be great. If you could get me uh, something else like, that I love to do, that's what I want. It's a hobby. Um, and maybe, maybe it's boat. Maybe it's a boat. Maybe it's like, you know what? You know, I, love to, I love to get out on the water, and so I wanna be able to, to, to have a boat to be able to do that with. I know my father-in-law, he's been asking for this for months. He wants a new boat. Well, I got him a boat for Christmas, so, um, so I'm very excited. He can actually have a boat now. And, but this is what we think of. This is what we think of when we, as adults, we think about Christmas. We think of what is practical, what do we need And today's message, um, talking about a boat, is gonna talk about a boat expert. We're gonna talk about this idea of of connecting a boat expert to Jesus. Trust me, I know it's it's kind of broad, but we'll get there, okay? So just bear with me. But before that, I wanna go ahead and pray over the message. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the opportunity to come to Shippensburg and and, uh, and, and speak to these uh, people. And God, I pray that you would allow our minds and our hearts to be open and connected to you. God, I pray that we would see uh, your Christmas story in a different way this morning. God, I pray that we'd be able to accept your son as the ultimate gift. God, we love you, and we thank you so much for this story. You know, you pray, amen. So, why am I talking about a man who is an expert at building boats on Christmas? You probably never thought about that before. How can we connect these two? So this morning, what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about Noah, just like Andrew read the story about Noah and his, um, his goal and his challenge to build the boat, to build the ark. And let me just tell you, for those of you that may not know completely about this story, is Noah was told by God to, to build the ark, and he gave him very specific instructions on how to build this ark. He said, I want you to build it exactly the way that I told you, the exact size that I need it to be, And oh, by the way, it's gonna take you a very long time to build it because you don't have the tools like we have. We don't have the modern tools to be able to build it. So if you can only imagine him building a boat that was as large as what it was, it would house two of every kind of animal. I can only imagine how hard that would be and how big this boat would have to be and how hard it would be to build it. I can't imagine that. In fact, it took him 50 to 75 years to build this boat. And once again, I can imagine the turmoil and the, the, the ridicule that he received from the people because they're thinking to him, okay, why are you building a boat? At this point, scholars have said that they, they believe that it's never rained. The scriptures don't say that it ever rained. It said that the, the water came from the ground up. It never said that it came from the sky down. And so at this point, He's building a boat saying, well, the Lord told me to, and the world's gonna be flooded. They're thinking, what are you talking about? And he said, it's gonna rain. They had no clue what that even meant. And so for 50 to 75 years, I can only imagine they were ridiculing him saying, why are you doing this? And he knew that there was a story. He knew that there was a reason for building a boat. Let me tell you the reason why he was told that he had to do this to, um, to save humanity because people were living, first of all, people were living to be hundreds of years old. When Noah died, he was actually 930 years old. Can you imagine that? I can't. He actually had his first son at 125. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I can't imagine that. So people were living to be so old I think I'm 43 and I'm thinking I'm old now, honestly. I cannot imagine being 125 and saying, hey, here's my first child. I can't imagine being 930 years old. It's the new 20, yeah. I can't imagine that. People were rebelling against God. People were forgetting. They'd forgotten who God was. They forgot what he created and what he gave them. People fell out of love with God. Just like Andrea said in this story, 
People started to rebel and people started to, um, there was murder. They were, they were against God. They were against his creation. And the problem is that people started to ignore God's rules, God's laws. And they started to do what they wanted. So this whole idea about the boat, it doesn't matter about the boat. But it matters about the reason for the boat. We're gonna connect Noah with Jesus and focus on the need for our Savior. But before we do that, I, I just need to kind of take a step and I need to show you that, that if we're gonna talk about the birth of Christ, if we're gonna take this story idea and we're gonna talk about this, we need to understand why Christ came in the first place. We need to understand the beginning. So it's like this. It's always a challenge whenever you try to come, in, come into the middle of something and you don't know what's going on, right? So if you come into a conversation, if you step ne near a conversation and there's two people talking and you try to get involved in the middle of a conversation, sometimes it can be a little awkward because you don't know what they're talking about. But you try, you sit, in, you sit there and you try to figure out, okay, where are you going with the story? It's hard to know because you came in the middle of the story. Or what about if you are, if your favorite football team is playing and you come into the middle of the game and you're, they're down by 30 points, what's the first thing you ask? First thing you ask is, what happened? This happened actually at the Cowboys and Washington game. Sorry if you're a Washington fan, but it didn't look good for you because they, had, they were down by so much. And if you came in the middle of that, that game, you'd say, like, what happened at the beginning? You need to go back to the beginning of the game to figure out, okay, where did they make the mistake? What happened there? Or let's think of another way is think of a movie. If you come in, if you turn a movie on and you're like, you know what, I wanna fast forward through this. I just wanna get to the ending and you, and you fast forward real quick into the middle. And you're like, okay, now I'm gonna watch the movie. It's really hard to figure out what the plot line is whenever you just miss the entire beginning. It's the same thing. Tucker and I were talking on, on Monday. By the way, Tucker's in Greencastle. He's preaching in Greencastle. I'm here, so it's like the takeover of the youth pastors. So I don't know whose idea that was, but, um, but anyway, side note, Tucker and I were talking on, on Monday about the Hunger Games. My family and I went to see the Hunger Games, and listen, I'm not promoting it. I'm not saying that you have to go see the Hunger Games, but uh, we saw the other three, so we're like, okay, we gotta go see the fourth movie. And so we were, I was talking to Tucker on Monday, and he said, do I need to see the other three movies to understand the fourth one? My response to him was, I said, yes. I said, because you need to know the storyline, and you need to know how it connects the dots. Because you need to be able to understand, okay, these characters, why are these characters important to, um, to the storyline? So you have to be able to see the movie. You have to be able to understand all, all the movies to be able to connect the dots. And I believe this is the same thing that happens with the story of Jesus. We need to go the whole way back to the beginning to understand his ministry. We all know that God created the world in six days. I don't wanna go back quite that far, but the world was created to have love at the center of it. The world was created to have the love of God at the center of it. And I have to tell you, the human beings messed that up. Because God only wanted love. He only wanted, that's why he created the Garden of Eden. That's why he created all of this. Because he wanted people to be able to walk through the garden and just be completely in love with what he created and what he was about. That's why in the morning that, that God would walk with them. Because he wanted, to be, he wanted to be close to them. He wanted to be connected to, to Adam and Eve. This is why he created heaven, and this is why he created the earth, simply because he loved us and because he wanted us to show him love. The world was created to have love in the center of it. So we're gonna focus on Genesis 6 this morning. I want, you to, I want you to focus on these words because it says, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or had imagined was constantly and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. 
Boy, if that doesn't say Merry Christmas, I don't know what does. When we're talking about human wickedness and evil, yeah, that definitely says Merry Christmas. That gives you the warm and fuzzies, doesn't it? It makes you say, oh, you know what, that, that, that gives us the Christmas spirit. But I want to stop for a second on the last part of verse 6, because it said it broke his heart. See, God saw all that he created, and he saw the destruction of that creation. He saw everything that he created in six days, and he looked at it, and he said, it is good. And then he made man, and, he, and, and man came on the earth, and, and he said, it is very good. We were created to be good. We were created to love. And then man brought evil. Man brought wickedness into it. And it broke his heart. God saw all the evil and everything that was on the earth. He saw the sinful nature that entered into his creation. He saw a world that didn't have love at the center of it anymore, the way that he created it. He created this world to have, have love at the center and for us to be able to, to look at every creation, every part of this and say, okay, there's God because I could see the trees and I could see the love because God created the trees, which is creating the oxygen, which is allowing me to breathe. God created a beautiful sunset for us to be able to look at. It's beautiful. It's showing love. All of these things God created for us, but to point back to him. He saw the world that he created for love and it had no more love in the center of it. This brought him pain because he felt the rejection of his own creation. See, the thing is, the people of that day loved everything else. They loved their possessions and they loved each other more than God. They loved themselves more than God. Does that sound familiar? I think if we're gonna focus on the human beings of Noah's time and we say that, that they loved everything else, they loved their possessions, they loved themselves more than God, I believe that that is a mirror for you and I. We're looking in the mirror and we're seeing the exact same thing happen. Because society has told us that we need to go and we have to buy all the possessions that we want. We need to buy everything to just make ourselves feel good, to make our homes feel comfortable, to make our family members happy. And yet, when is the last time that we stop and we think about our father? When was the last time we stopped and said, you know what, I just want to thank you for, for the breath that I'm breathing, for the air that I'm breathing? When was the last time you walked out and you saw a sunset, when you walked out and saw the stars in the sky and just said, thank you? Yeah. I believe that society has caused us to, to look at ourselves and look at our possessions and say, that shows true love. That is what God really intended for love to be, instead of just looking to our Father. And I believe that we are all created to love something. The center of love is supposed to be God, but we have added things in its place. For instance, once again, we think about jewelry, but this could be our family. This could be our husbands and our wives or our kids, and we think, okay, let me put my family before, before God. What about our home? We think about our appliances. We think about our home, and we say, you know what? I love my home, and I'm just gonna stay in my home. I'm not gonna go outside and see what God created. I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna love my home more than God. I'm gonna put my my projects at home before sitting down and reading the scripture. And if I could tell you, trust me, I am not pointing the finger at you because I guarantee you that I am just as guilty. What about our jobs? Our jobs get in the way. We dress up and we put on a tie or we put on a, 
a dress and I don't put on a dress, that'd be weird. Um, but I don't know where it's high either. But, but we dress up and we think, okay, now I have to go and I have to, I have to do my job. Well, my job gets in my way of my relationship with God because I get so stressed out, I think of nothing but my relationship with my work instead of my relationship with God. What about our hobbies? What about the things that we really like to do? Like, you know what? I I don't want to go and read the scriptures. I don't want to spend time with God because I've got to fill it with something else. I've got to, I want to do something else. I want to go boating. I want to go skiing. I want to um, work in my wood shop. That's great, but are you taking God with you? Is he part of your hobby? What about ourselves? If we're gonna look in the mirror and we say, you know what? I'm gonna focus on myself more than God. I'm gonna focus on my own desires more than God. Because I'm important. Because I matter. And so instead of taking the time to say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put myself aside and I'm not gonna focus on my own desires, I'm not gonna focus on my own selfishness, and I'm just gonna sit down and I'm gonna say, you know what, God, I wanna learn more about you. That's what we're supposed to do, but yet we don't do it, do we? We don't take the time to, to stop and to, um, to look beyond ourselves and look beyond our own desires and our own wants because we're so focused on ourselves that we can't see truly what God has for us. We tend to love ourselves and our desires more than God and more the desires that he has for our lives. In 2 Corinthians 5.15, Paul wrote, he died for everyone so that those who receive his life new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and raised from the dead. So, no longer live for themselves. So Christ died so that you and I no longer live for ourselves. See, all these modern things get in the way of us seeing truly what God has for us because we're only focused on that. But the biggest thing is that our selfish desires and wants get in the way. We become obsessed with ourselves and with our own needs. So my question for you this morning is, what would you love to have this Christmas season? What is on your needs list? Do you need more stuff? Or do you truly need the gift of healing restoration, and maybe even the gift of salvation? Will your needs and wants replace your love for God and push him further away? I believe as adults, we have a tendency to either say, okay, we don't think of our true needs, we only think of our true wants. The last part of Genesis 6 It says, and the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the animals, all the people, the large animals, and the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor in the Lord. This verse is hard to read because it's the entire human race, except for one man. Noah found favor in the Lord. Noah was loved by God because Noah loved God more than anything. Because of the love mankind can because of that, love mankind continued. Because he loved God more than anything. And he was willing to do whatever he had to do to try to show that love. And for Noah, it was building the ark. Genesis 9, 8 says, Then God said to Noah and his sons, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. The descendants after you 
That is you and I. We're shown the love of the Father because Noah loved the Father. We are part of Noah's descendants. And in fact, if you look at Noah's genealogy, the Bible, there's a lot of different names that we don't know. But there are a lot of stories that we know and a lot of names that we do know. Like the story of Abraham and his covenant with the Lord. God told Abraham in Genesis 22, it says, he said, I will surely bless you and bless your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So we go from Noah to Abraham. And I want to show you this, this timeline. It's very hard to see, and I do apologize for that. But this timeline will show you from Adam the whole way to Jesus and how everybody is connected Because we go from Jesus' birth, from Mary. Mary and Joseph were distant cousins. Let's not talk about that. They were distant cousins. (laughs) It was a different time back then, okay? But they were distant cousins, which means they were connected. They were directly connected to King David, who was connected to Abraham, who was connected to Noah. And this is how you and I are connected to the covenant that God gave both to Noah and to Abraham. Because both of these gentlemen, that he told them, your descendants will be blessed. You and I are blessed because we are their descendants. This is how we start the story of Christmas. God made a covenant through Noah. But it wasn't enough to get to the Father, was it? That didn't allow you and I to get to heaven because of Noah, because God flooded the earth. We needed an eternal savior that came through the gift of Christ's birth. Noah's reset was only temporary because man continued to love their possessions and other things before God. We needed a true love the true love of the Son to give the gift of eternal salvation. We needed to hear the beginning of the story. We need to hear the beginning of the story to know the amazing ending. Once again, Noah wasn't enough to get you and I to the Father. If we don't understand the purpose of needing a Savior we won't understand the gift of having a Savior. Did you hear that? If we don't understand the purpose of needing a Savior, we won't understand the gift of having a Savior. We take it for granted. Just like our possessions, we take it for granted. So here's my challenge for you this morning. As you wrap this up, my question to you is, What do you need this Christmas? Maybe it's to recognize the covenant that God has given you to bless you and for for you to receive the blessing. Is it you need more stuff? Would that make you happy? Would that satisfy you? Would that fill any void that you have? Or maybe it's to truly accept the gift that we all receive, the gift of healing, the gift of redemption, the gift of a Savior. If you recall in Genesis 6, 5, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. Nothing has changed with Noah's time and our time, except for Jesus. He's the only difference Noah didn't have Jesus as a savior. So the only difference is Jesus. God flooded the earth to start over, to have a reset. And then he did it again by sending his only son to die on the cross. 
for you and I. The world is still wicked and we still need a savior. We still need a healer. Our healing doesn't require a flood, but it does require a gift. So what is your gift this year? What do you need healing from this year? Maybe your family is broken. Maybe your marriage is in trouble. Maybe you have physical or mental pain. Maybe your job is overwhelming. Maybe your life is simply spiraling out of control. Or maybe you just simply need Jesus. I invite you to look at that gift differently this year. you to stop and just think about what do I need not stuff not the junk that we put in our lives what do I need do I need healing this is not a typical Advent Christmas sermon I'm not going to apologize for that (laughs) because I believe this is the message that the Lord has for each and every one of us. But I want to invite you to take a moment. The worship team is going to play a song called Lord, I Need You. And I want you to stop and I want you to think about what do I need this Christmas? How does this look? struggling with? What are you wrestling with? What is heavy on your heart? It's your story. You fill in a blank. But as they sing this song, I want this to be a reflection for you. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, sing, you do whatever you want. But my question is, are you going to find Jesus at the end of your need? Are you going to stop, can you stop thinking about your wants and think about what do I need right now? This is where we start the Christmas season. Right here. This is where we begin. This is how we look at Christmas differently. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the beginning. I thank you for allowing us to be able to see where all this began and how we needed a healer. God, I pray that right now you would allow us all to be able to hit the reset. We get to start over. To look at our needs differently this year. God, I pray that we would bring this before you. We'd lay this at your feet. And you would give us the gift that you have for us whether it's the gift of healing, whether it's the gift of redemption, or whether it's a gift of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we'd receive that gift and the blessing that comes with it. What do you pray? Amen.
salvation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my So buckle in, stay in tight. We're going to get through this together. Um, <laughs> thank you, Scott. I, I immediately thought of this morning um, as I was listening to you um, when I was just a baby Christian and uh, Pastor Gilbert at the time, I would always ask him, you know, well, what do I do about like the things that I enjoy now that I've said yes to Jesus? Like it's been a hot minute and you expect me to just like drop all these things that, that I enjoy. It's not going to be that easy never forget this as I still remind myself of this very thing when I find myself falling short and tripping up. He said, you know, it's not that you will stop loving those things. It's that you will fall in love with Jesus more and more and more and more to those things become a distant memory. Um, for those of you that are married in here this morning, I mean, I would hope so, but when you are in a relationship with somebody, the more you get to know them, right? The more you start to shape into one when two become flesh. Or if you're friends with somebody, the more you learn about them, the more you get to see how they tick and the more you get to appreciate them. So God, thank you so much for this day. Um, yeah, so I, I also challenge you to, with Scott's challenge, just that, that question of the need. Don't just like leave that here. Share that with somebody, whether it be someone at school or your spouse or a sibling, a friend. We need to hold each other accountable as to where our eyes need to be and how we can stick with that throughout our week and throughout these coming months as well. Um, Becky is over at the hub today. Everyone say hi to Becky. Okay, five people. Guys, everyone wave at Becky. Let's be friendly. There we go. If you've never met Becky, you've never walked over to the hub, especially if this is your first, second, or third time, fourth. I mean, I don't care if it's your 10th time if you've never been over there. We have a gift for you. We would love for you to go get it. If you have questions about anything that's upcoming, um, questions about um, just the word today, we want to, you to ask those questions and wrestle through those questions. Go over there to Becky and she will point you in the right, take you to the right direction wherever you need to go. Um, next week, we are gonna continue with these um, just different elements as we as we lead up to Christmas Eve. Um, we have some readings coming up and a story, I think, on Christmas Eve. We have some awesome things planned. Uh, but I know for next week, so you know how in like most movies, the whole idea, right, is that by the end of it, you should feel some severance of hope, right? except for those movies that you watch and you feel like you wasted your whole life because it was really negative. Um, but that's what next week is gonna be all about because that's what this, the birth of Christ is all about. People having no hope, they were on their last leg and um, then God made a way as he always does. So we're gonna be talking about hope, the hope that we have in Christ next week um, and Christmas services. Okay, so Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, if you didn't know. And this is how Shippensburg is doing their times. We're having a 9 a.m. same Christmas Eve service, even though it's in the morning, and a 3 p.m. So plan accordingly. Um, 
It's gonna be the same thing, so there's no reason for you to, I mean, unless you really want to, but there's no reason for you to come to both. It's literally gonna be the same service, just one in the morning at nine, and then in the evening-ish at 3 p.m., so we can make sure you guys have that family time in the evening. Um, well, we give because we love the Lord, and there are boxes on either side of this um, tech table or over here in the back. You can give online. It's really, really easy. Becky can help you with that. Um, it's just a way for us to continue to worship the Lord and give back to Him because He's given so much to us so freely. Uh, thank you guys for being here today. We hope we see you in the Sundays to come and especially on Christmas Eve. You guys have a good week. See ya.